Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Matthew Feeney. And joining us today is Thomas Merrill. He's Associate Professor of Government and Associate Director of the Political Theory Institute at American University. He's also author of the new book, Hume and the Politics of Enlightenment from Cambridge University Press. So a couple of years back, the philosophy podcast, Philosophy Bites, uh, did a episode where they had a bunch of their guests – I mean I'm guessing 50, 60, 70 of them – just briefly say who their favorite philosopher was and these were all academic philosophers. And the two front runners by an enormous margin – I tried to look up the tally this morning but couldn't find one. So I'm relying on recollection. But the two front runners were Aristotle and then David Hume. Um, and I think Hume probably edged out Aristotle. So maybe we start with I mean, we're going to get into the specifics of Hume's thought and his biography and all that. But what is it about him that makes him this popular? Well, I think I think Hume exemplifies a certain kind of skeptical spirit that speaks to a lot of people who get interested in philosophy, and I think that's probably the, the most important thing for the the fact that you mention. Um, I mean, I think in terms of you know politics, I mean, you know, he's a gigantically influential person on things that you know people at Cato care about, right? I mean, he has a big influence on the American founding. He's, um, you know, when James Madison sits down to write Federalist Ten, he has Hume's essays by his hand, and there's a pretty close connection that you can draw between Hume and Madison, and therefore the rest of the American founding, right? Uh, Hamilton, in particular. Um, also, he's uh, you know he's Adam Smith's best friend, right? So he's um, he's right there at the origins of what we like to think of as classical liberalism or commercial republicanism. So I think those two things are the reason why people think Hume is important. Uh, and and who was he exactly? I mean, very influential on in the American founding, but he was uh, Scottish originally. Right? Uh, yes, right. So so he was a Scottish philosopher. Uh, I'm not sure that anybody ever has philosophers of job title. Uh, <laughs> he actually has a bunch of different jobs, including being uh, he, he took care of a crazy guy for a while. He was a librarian. He was, and eventually he's an author who publishes lots of books and is able to live off his royalties. But um, he's uh, born in 1711. He dies in 1776. Um, he writes one book, Theories of Human Nature, this gigantic failure. And then tries again. It's a good lesson for all of us authors. And eventually um, becomes an extremely popular. Right? His history of England is is one of the major bestsellers in the 18th century, and you know a very important work of political theory. So, and what was his, uh, I suppose, philosophical project? Uh, why are philosophers interested in him? What's his? Uh well, uh, I would say in the 20th century, philosophers are interested in him because they like the empiricism and the skepticism. Uh, I would say in his time, he's um, not known for that so much as he is known for really what I think was the first generation of, of classical liberalism or what scholars sometimes call commercial republicanism. And so I think it's in that mode as a kind of political educator or as a person who's talking about ideas and trying to justify what really is in the mid 18th century a radical new regime? That that's why he's important from a you know, sort of a political moral point of view. Uh, we could talk about you know the 20th century and why philosophers like him if you want, but but um, I think just from the the political point of view, that's that's the main thing. So what do we mean by? I mean, he's known as a skeptic. Um, yeah. So what do we mean by that? What was he responding to, and what did the skepticism look like? Well, um, so the skepticism um, – this is in a way that the most the, the complicated topic in Hume. Um, he gives us – in his treatise, he gives us a um, kind of autobiographical description of uh, – that, that you know, he understands himself to be a philosopher who wants to know what's the truth about why some things cause other things. And he gets to a point when he realizes in order to answer that question, in order to explain why science explains the world, he's got to have some answer to the question of what, what the ultimate cause is. And science doesn't have that and Hume doesn't have that and I'm not sure that anybody else really does either. And he presents it almost as though he has an existential crisis, right? That there's this kind of, you know, like, oh my goodness, I don't know. You know, why does the sun rise tomorrow? How do I know that? And um, – and I think a lot of you know many many philosophers have had that kind of experience and recognize that as you know um, perhaps not inspiring but more honest than uh, you know this kind of story that you might get from Aristotle. 
Um, but I, one of the things that I argue in the book is that that's not just a personal thing for Hume, that he sees this – he's sort of telling this story as it were as kind of a political parable. He sees that um, in European history that uh, it's not just him that has been interested in these questions about the ultimate cause but that um, – you know, in medieval times, this is uh, what he calls superstition, that people come up with these accounts of what the ultimate cause is and then they try to rule in politics on the basis of that. And But if, as seems to be the case, that nobody has kind of a settled answer to that, the political consequence of trying to um, make your philosophy in the grandest sense the basis for politics means um, religious warfare, nonstop religious warfare, which is really the political story of Europe between 1500 and 1700. So his skepticism is I think a, an attempt to try to um, uh, recognize first of all that, that that's insanity, right? This is, this is horrible and you know, many, many people die. Um, without I think giving up on the idea that somehow those questions um, are questions that we can't stop asking, right? That there's um, there's some part of the human spirit that that you know in Plato's image wants to be outside of the cave, and that Hume knows very well. And so I think his skepticism when he talks about it in the treatise and in the essays is really an attempt to somehow do justice to both of those truths. That um, you know, we are beings that want to know the truth about the world, but we're also beings that need a certain amount of political sanity and want to be down to earth and uh, you know not go off in crazy religious crusades or something like that. So, is this related to, to probably his most famous idea? Is the the problem of induction right? Is this is that related to the skepticism? And Absolutely. What, what is that? So, the problem of induction is how do you know that causes produce effects. And so when we start reasoning inductively about the world, we say, you know, well, what causes um, tuberculosis or something? And you go out and you try to figure out what the cause is and as a good empirical scientist. And that makes a lot of sense and it's, it's tremendously powerful and, you know, there's no doubt that our entire world has been transformed by it. But when you start asking what's the – why do we think that causes actually produce effects um, and if you turn the inductive process onto itself – then you sort of have to look for what's the evidence that you know the world is a rational place, and there is no evidence. Is Hume's most basic point, and um, so that's kind of a problem, right? Yeah. So that's it seems the, like a rather large one. It's a rather large one. <laughs> yep, that's right. That's yeah. Uh, and I think that Hume would say uh, you have to sort of face up to that. You can't just try to like push that into a corner and forget about it, but you also don't want to keep you from trying to figure out more in sort of a piecemeal way that you can about the world that we live in. So that's his, I suppose, epistemology and yeah. um, sitting uh, here in Washington in the Cato Institute, we spend a bit more time worrying about politics, uh, which yeah. you've just uh, written a book about. And yes. so what um, – given Hume's conception of how we know things and what, how people are, what, what was he thinking about politically, especially given that uh, Hobbes before him had written a very influential book, The Leviathan. Right. Uh, so what was Hobbes uh, – sorry, excuse me. Uh, what was Hume's uh, politics and his uh, attitudes towards that? So uh, I think the scholarly term for Hume's politics is commercial republicanism. Uh, what that means um, in the first instance is – the uh, the political good for Hume is individual liberty under law. Um, it's it's not just individual liberty because um, you know that that would be anarchy and you know strong people beating up weak people. Um, but on the other hand, it is um, having a kind of protected space for individuals to lead their lives in the way that they see fit. So I think of um, Hume and really Hume and Montesquieu at almost exactly the same time, I think from different points of view, arrive at the same basic position that, the, that what you want out of a government is um, protection from violence but also protection from arbitrary power. And that means uh, you want a regime that has rule of law as the most important thing and you want a regime that is able to back that up. Um, so when he thinks about individual liberty, I think today we, we often think about it as democracy, that you get to have your say in politics. And Hume's view is more, I want to, be, I want to have a government that's strong enough to protect me, but that is not going to come and, and do bad things to me, basically. So how does he fit into uh, the, the group of philosophers that we might call the social contract theorists uh, who were also operating in, I suppose, similar sort of time period? Uh, 
Uh, so, we, uh, yes. Well, um, around then. Uh, so this, uh, so Hume is in some ways very close to someone like Locke, um, but uh, but I would say there's a, a sort of a family quarrel between the two. Um, Hume has got famous criticisms of the whole idea of the social contract, the idea that somehow there was this moment when everyone comes together and agrees. And Hume thinks that historically that's false. And if you say that the only legitimate regimes are ones in which everyone gave explicit consent, then um, that's very difficult to actually have happen. And that undermines the regimes that we actually have um, without sort of a clear better alternative. And so Hume is quite harsh on the idea of the original contract. But I think you have to – you know, so that sometimes people say, well, Locke is the liberal and Hume is the conservative. But I think it's more complicated than that because Hume also – he says, look, the, the contractarians, the, the effective truth of contractarianism is if the government is screwing you over, you have a right to rebel. And Hume definitely agrees with that, um, that it's um, – he thinks maybe we shouldn't talk about it as much as Locke or Jefferson or something like that. Um, it's politically dangerous, but it's also pretty clearly a truth for Hume that that when the government uh, is oppressing people, people are going to push back. So it's a it's kind of a mixed bag. It's wrong on the theory, but right on the practice. I guess would be one way of saying it. Um, so. But he was he was a bit more reserved in his willingness to embrace revolution than say Locke. Like Locke, you know, as soon as the government is here to do these things, the moment yes. the government stops doing these things. You need to overthrow it and make a better one. Right. But Hume seems to think like, no, as long as the government is largely working or isn't too awful, then you have an obligation to support it. Is that a fair or – Obligation is a tricky word. Um, yeah, I think the, the difference is that Locke thinks um, you know, if you're going to have a revolution, you have to you – know, the people are naturally conservative and so you have to really talk them up into it. So you have to go way on the other end of you know, let's you – know, Go get your guns. And Hume thinks it's much more fragile that political order can be destroyed pretty easily. And he's thinking of you know the English Civil War um, and things like that. But so here's an example of the difference between um, of how Hume treats the right of rebellion um, in the history of England. He tells the story about uh, Charles the First who is executed by the parliamentarians. And in general, Hume is pretty clearly on the side of the parliamentarians that he thinks this is sort of the way that the right regime should be a representative democracy that protects property. Um, Charles I gets executed um, and Hume tells this very – you know, it's this sort of tragic story of this guy who couldn't somehow figure out how to um, live with the, the new world that he was in. Uh, and then Hume, um, after telling the story, he says uh, – Oh, and by the way, if there was ever a truth that you should hide from the people, it's the idea that you can ever legitimately oppose your monarch and maybe even kill him. So never, ever talk about this in public, okay? <laughs> and uh, which is sort of funny. I mean, the history of England is like the most read history in British, right? And so there's um, – and then he goes on for three pages to talk about all the cases in which you might do exactly that, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a very weird kind of dance that he does that on the one hand, don't talk about this. But I am talking about this, right? This kind of a performative contradiction. My own sense is that he's playing with us; that it's kind of a joke, right? That he knows that you're going to see through that he's that he doesn't really keep it a secret, um, but that he's trying to give you kind of a lesson, like exemplify how to handle it. That it, this is a very sensitive thing; that you shouldn't just, you know, um, tell people go have a rebellion over every small thing, but you want to sort of preserve it as a possibility over the long run. This saying like I guess not saying what he's really saying or what he wants to say seems to be a theme throughout his life though. I mean so we get with the the treatise, there are many chapters that were cut from the original yes, right and that's his right. uh castrated of its noblest parts, as he said. And his his time. work yeah, on right. I mean he was he was an atheist, right? Uh, yes. And right. and he kind of hid that. His work on religion was published after his death. Um was this I mean how much did this kind of play into the – so obviously his work on religion and atheism, we had to cut out because it would have been bad for him. But these other ideas, how much did that sense of like people don't like what I'm going to say play into maybe how he colored? Uh, I think he's – I mean I think a lot of the great philosophers are very self-conscious about how they say things in public. And I think that's, that's an important theme that you, you have to keep in mind. It should also be said um, – so this thing that we just talked about, induction, I mean that is in a way the religious question without talking about religion because it is I – mean, that's, the, that's the thing behind it. What's the ultimate cause or you know, what is God I guess would be the um, one way of saying it. 
Um, yeah, I mean, Hume, you know, hides certain things. He says it's castrated of its noblest parts, but many, many people were not fooled. Uh, I mean, Hume uh, tried to get a job as a professor at the University of Edinburgh and fails because everyone says he's an atheist. So, you know, in some ways, he's not so good at that, right? And if you really, if you really want to keep a secret, then you would just not say anything. But I think Hume both wants to be discreet, but also to say what he really thinks. So I think it's. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's the answer to your question or not. But. So uh, your mention of Edinburgh reminded me of uh, another Scot that played a big role in Hume's yeah. life, which is uh, Adam Smith, right. uh, who you know, we think a lot about here at the Cato Institute. Sure. Uh, yeah. So what was, uh, what was their relationship? Uh, they were friends. Uh, but then also perhaps more importantly, what was their influence uh, on one another? OK. So uh, Hume and Smith are best friends um, and they, they have a lot in common. Um, Hume is the elder by I think 11 years. Um, I guess from an intellectual point of view, uh, Hume writes uh, in the essays he, he – and, and right around late 1740s, early 1750s, he writes a whole series of essays about commerce that you might think of as a kind of sketch for the kind of arguments that you're going to see in Wealth of Nations. Wealth of Nations is not published until 1776, so you're really talking about 25 years later. And Wealth of Nations is the much more sophisticated, fully worked out version of those arguments. But I would say that, um, yeah, that what we think of as the arguments for commerce really come out of that milieu. I mean, I would say it's really Montesquieu in France and the spirit of the laws give some version of this. Hume gives a version of this and then Adam Smith gives you the great wealth of nations. But they did agree uh, – I mean correct me if I'm wrong but it's, I seem to remember uh, that, that Hume is like Smith thought commerce was a good thing, that it helped Most perfect – perfected yes. um, or helped them people improve their life. Yes. Uh, and, and depressingly I think – I mean so Hume dies in 1776 which is the right. year of the wealth of nations That's is correct. published. Yes. Uh, and he did uh, read it, uh, I think. But the uh, I, I know uh, that there was a, a letter written where he, he brings up some issue with, uh, I think, the, the pricing um, system, although he's a fan of the book. He says yeah. uh, he has some quarrels with it. It's a shame I think we don't know his in-depth criticisms. Uh, but does this um, attitude towards commerce come from um, – some sort of deeper philosophical foundation? Uh, where does that come from? Yeah, so I would say um, – so if you were – so Hume thinks government – government's job is to basically let you live your life and uh, for that you need a, a regime that supports rule of law. Um, but it's not enough just to have like a constitution that says we're going to have rule of law, right? You know, what Madison would call parchment barriers, that it has to be um, – the regime has to be rooted in a group of people who are actually willing to support and stand up for – the rule of law. So when Hume looks at um, the, the history of England between 1500 and his time, the big sociological change is what we now call rise of the middle class. And Hume is really the guy who first kind of puts this on the map as an intellectual matter. He's, and, and he says um, commerce is good because uh, it allows people who were previously serfs to basically get off the plantation and to – uh, become artisans and manufacturers and live in cities and that they start to see themselves differently. And so from his point of view, they're really the sociological – the middle class is a sociological basis for a regime that's going to protect individual li liberty. So it's good politically. It's better for them because they are no longer um, under some you know, feudal lord's thumb and they can live their own lives, which might not be lives like Hume's. They're not going to be philosophers, right? Um, but I think the most important reason um, is really just the support of uh, a regime that supports rule of law. That's the thing that, that he thinks it's ultimately the, it's a good thing. So behind all of this is Hume's moral theory, which he also – I mean, so I understand. So Adam Smith has his theory of moral sentiments, and Hume is often sees also a moral sentiments guy. Yes, uh, and also gets. I mean, today in kind of the modern virtue ethics tradition, he's seen as part of that as well. Um, so how, what, is his, what does his underlying moral theory look like and how does it play into this you – know, we, we need to base our morals on something but this problem of induction makes it awfully hard to find the floor or figure out where to start? Yeah. So, so that's a good question. Um, 
I, I mean, Hume is a skeptic, uh, and I think you know people, scholars today, want to go back and find in moral sentiment theory kind of a new foundation for morality. Um, I'm not so sure that that's what Hume understands himself to be. I think he thinks um, he, he thinks human beings are moralizing animals; that so they can't stop having moral opinions of praise or blame, like this is right or wrong. That's quite a different thing than saying. Um, that they always act morally, mm -hmm. right? And he's and you know Hume is uh, there's a lot of irony. He says you know the best regimes, the, the freest regimes, um, so republics are often the worst for the provinces um, because people in the regime it's really good for them, but when they conquer another regime, they're perfectly willing to do all kinds of awful things. And so I think for him the question is less can we establish the one true morality than it is thinking sort of prudently about what are um, our actual interests. And um, so he's less on the sort of moralizing, telling people how to live kind of side of things than he is on, well, if we see things in a very clear-minded, empirical point of view, we'll realize that it's actually in our interest to have a regime that, that protects, uh, protects people's property rights no matter who they are. Um, and you know, I can't have my – I can't expect that my rights are going to be protected unless we have a regime that's protecting everyone's rights. And so it's that kind of uh, self-interest rightly understood I think is – would be a better description of Hume's moral stance than some highfalutin here's the you know, universal principle that solves everything. So does this then depend on the people's intuitions? Like if – is it is it kind of the state and the rules of justice and what the state ought to be doing have a conventional – direction to them because if – so you're depending on this group of people saying, look, I have a set of interests and these interests are going to be furthered by political liberty of this kind and having a state that protects these things. But we can see broad differences in say cultures between what they value and so would the ideal political system or would Hume's system look different or fall apart in say places that weren't 18th century England? Uh, OK. So, th so that's a tough question. Uh, Hume thinks if you uh, take an unvarnished look at what the human condition is, that um, we want to better our conditions and he thinks that that is um, kind of an elemental truth that can be hidden by all kinds of crazy cultural things but that is you know, part of just what it means to be a human being. Um, he definitely doesn't think that um, – England should go around trying to tell everyone else that they should be just like England or trying to conquer them into, into being liberal democracies or anything like that. Um, but I think he thinks if you um, – once you break the spell of religion as the, um, the sort of glue that holds society together and people start thinking honestly about what their interests are, they will more or less come around to seeing that something like a regime of rule of laws is really the way to go. Um, but it's – his arguments are always more on here's what your interest is and this is why it leads to this kind of regime. Um, I guess one way that I think about this, when he presents his political scientist, he presents himself as a political scientist more than as a moral philosopher. Okay. I think that's an important thing to say. And uh, his main source, if you read the essays, when he explains his political science, like what's the source? Well, it's all Machiavelli. Like explicitly, it's Machiavelli. And I think that's that's an important truth that that he um, he thinks that realism is a better basis for uh, a solid regime and for people's commitment to the regime than than it is talking about moral sentiments. So, well, your your, uh, your question, Aaron, made me think. I mean, the fact that uh, yeah, maybe uh, Hume applicable to 18th century England, but we started the discussion by talking about the American founding uh, and. Why uh, – what was it exactly that, that made him so attractive uh, to figures like Madison, Hamilton or, or Jefferson? Uh, I mean well, is it this the, – the role of government exactly? Yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. yeah so, it, so it's not Jefferson. Jefferson hates oh, Hume. Right. <laughs> but um, it, yeah, in uh, – Hume's political science is a political science that starts from the proposition that you can't expect people – you can't expect rulers to do the right thing just because they're nice guys. That you need to set up institutions that are somehow going to, I think he says, make it the interest of even of bad men to preserve the constitution and preserve the rule of law. So, um, yeah, I mean, you could think of Hume as the place where Machiavellian insights um, enter the constitutional tradition. 
that you want to design institutions that ambition is going to check ambition in the phrase of Federalist 51. Um, everything that you see, I would say, in Federalist 10 and Federalist 51 are – it's not just Hume. It's, there are lots of other people. But that's the general spirit of Humean constitutionalism. We want to design institutions. They're going to build competition into the institution so that people are sort of more likely to do the things that we want them to do rather than the things that you know, just tyrannizing everybody else is they're likely to do. Yeah. Uh, why did Jefferson hate Hume? So um, – well, it's a complicated story. It's uh, you know, so the American founders split, uh, as you know, after the uh, the Federalist Papers, um, and there's a big fight between Hamilton on the one side and Jefferson and Madison on the other, and and I think uh, so after 1800, Jefferson writes many many letters, maybe a dozen letters, saying that Hume is a really awful person. Uh, I think in, there's one letter in which he says something like, uh, "Hume has done more to undermine." the rights of man in Europe than all the troops of Napoleon's armies. <laughs> um, and I think the, the easy answer is that he sees Hume as um, – he associates Hume with Hamilton and there's this residual bitterness over this titanic battle over what the constitution means in the 1790s. But I think there's uh, – I think Jefferson – in my own sense, Jefferson is kind of an enthusiast that he, he thinks uh, if you're on the – if you're morally correct, then everything you do is going to be the right thing. And Hume is much more of a skeptic that Hume doesn't think that um, at the end of the day that if you have majority rule, that majorities are going to do the right thing. And so I think there's just a different kind of disposition that um, you know Jefferson – I think Hume would say Jefferson is more of an ideologue and that Hume is more of a disillusioned realist or something like that. So. Is that willingness to – or that embrace of kind of the messiness like that we can't – have these perfect systems that we apply but that we've kind of got to work with. Is that part of the distinction between – like you mentioned, he thought of himself more as a political scientist than a political philosopher. Is that part of that difference? Or I guess what is it – what does it mean to say he's more of a political scientist than a political philosopher? So I wouldn't say uh, – I wouldn't make the contrast between political science and political philosophy. I would say political science versus moral philosophy. Okay. Um, and I think that it goes back to the, the kind of the insight um, that you can't ex- – you, preaching is not going to get you anywhere getting people to do what you think is the right thing, that you need somehow to speak to their interests rather than to um, – because morality is what we all say in public, right? Um, but oftentimes we – when we get the chance, we, we don't do we do not do that. Um, and this is – I think when he makes that, that line about republics being the worst for their provinces, right? When, when there's no check on your power, you are going to act like a tyrant. He thinks that's true about everyone, including maybe himself. So um, – I think he he always thinks you know you have to somehow start by speaking to where people are rather than where you want them to be. And so I'll give you an example that goes back to the commerce thing. When he makes his case for commerce, he starts by asking by taking the point of view of the sovereign, right? That the sovereign is is the guy who's going to make the choice. Let's say the king of England. And he says to the king of England, he says, "Okay, you want to increase your power. What's the best way that you can do that?" Well, maybe you would want to do that by going back to ancient Sparta and making sure that everyone's devoted to the cause, right? And having everyone on the same team, and then you can all, you know, have this army that you're going to send out and beat your enemies. But if you think about it, that's actually not the right way to increase your power, because uh, it's going to be much better if you say to the people, okay, you can go out and benefit yourself by engaging in commerce. You're going to become richer. And Hume says sort of like this sneaky advice to the sovereign. So they're going to get richer and richer. And then when you need them, when you need an army, you can always come and take their stuff and force them to an, into the army. You're going to have a much stronger army because they're, they're – basically they're going to think that they're working for themselves when they're actually working for you, right? And so um, it's a very Machiavellian kind of real politique. If you want to have a strong country, you should allow commerce. You should allow the freedom of commerce because the country is going to be richer and then you're going to have a stronger army. And I think Hume is basically right about that. Okay? So that sounds very Machiavellian, like there's no morality. It's just all real politic. But then the thing that I think is really striking and this is the other side of the story that people sometimes fail to note, right, is that as Hume's essays go on, it becomes clear well, what happens when the sovereign allows commerce to proceed. Well, you're going to get this rising middle class. The middle class is going to become stronger and stronger and more and more people are going to be part of it. And then there's – they're going to start to see themselves as political actors and they're going to say, hey, wait a minute. We're like 
a big part of the society. We want representation in parliament. And this is basically the story of England between 1500 and 1700, right? Is that the sovereigns, right? The Tudor kings um, uh, basically allow commerce to go, and they, well, even while they're killing off all the aristocrats. Um, and but what what's the the ultimate outcome? Well, eventually the middle class rises up and kills the king, right? So, and I think Hume knows that, and his audience knows that. And this advice that he gives to the sovereign that looks very real politique is it's sort of like a poison poisoned apple, right? You, the sovereign has to do it; it's in his interest to um, allow commerce to move, pr proceed. But over time, over generations, it's also going to lead to the undermining of his own regime. And eventually, right? So Charles I is going to have his head cut off, right? So um, I think that's that's an example. So if, if you think about it, Hume's advice to the sovereign allow people to think they're working in their own self interest, and it's going to redound to your benefit. Actually, describes the advice that he gives to the sovereign himself. He says to the sovereign, "Do what you think is in your, your self interest, and it's going to have this long term effect that supports." Uh, free governments and is actually opposed to absolute monarchy. That's an example of what I would think of as the Hume sort of mo in trying to um, su you know support political freedom and rule of law and, and that kind of stuff. So then, what did the political classes think of Hume at the time? Did I mean was he expressing what was in the zeitgeist or was he going against the grain? Did they have do we know what sort of opinion they had of his political philosophy? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I mean, lots of people think that Hume is dangerous, right? Like he's, you know, they, they I mean, he has this reputation as an atheist mm -hmm. or as a Hobbesist or something like that. Um, and, so, and I'm not sure, you know, what the ruling classes of Great Britain in 1765 thought about this. I mean, I would just say, you know, in, in a way, I mean, Hume's legacy is are, are the Americans, right? In the whole discussion about, you know, the battle between. Jefferson and Madison on the one side and Hamilton on the other, right? That's that's the place where Hume's influence really shows itself. Um, and I would say um, Hamilton in a way says we need more commerce and we need less agriculture and that's that's uh, one interpretation of what the me Hume's message is, right? So I would see Hume on, sort of on both sides of the American struggle but that's that's where I would see the, the main influence. So I want to ask a um – a question about uh, the English Civil War. So uh, it seems interesting to me that uh, – so we have Charles I who seems to be a, a monarch who didn't follow Hume's um, ideal, I guess, advice. Uh, and But then what was Hume's attitude then on republicanism? Uh, because uh, it seems hard to square Hume's attitudes uh, if – I mean am I wrong in thinking that he was skeptical of republics uh, and – uh, and you know, okay with monarchy uh, under certain circumstances, uh, because I, I, unless I'm wrong, he was um, he seemed to think that perhaps reluctantly that the execution of Charles I was, uh, or the outcome of the English Civil War was uh, the right one. Or am I wrong about that? I'm trying to. So uh, it's been a while since yes, I thought a, about it's that. A, it's a complicated question. Yeah. Uh, Hume is on the side of the Parliament, mm -hmm. so it's a long battle between Parliament and the Stuart Kings. Right? Mm -hmm. Not just Charles; it's also his dad. And uh, Charles's father, James I, had, was you know, representative of the divine right of kings theory. And Hume um, thinks that that's crazy and that that is um, you know, all in the long run a really bad thing. And so he's on the side of the parliament I would say through the 1620s all the way up to the beginning of the English Civil War. Um, but you know, look. I mean, there, there aren't, and in, in the final analysis, there are no good guys in the conversation, right? So once the parliament overthrows um, the king, they kind of go crazy, right? They can't restrain themselves. And um, I would say that you know, the, for Hume, Charles the First, the person maybe not so important, but that somehow the institution. Um, represents some sense of constitutionalism, right? That we're all on the same team and we're going to allow ourselves to be bound by whatever the rules of the game are right now. And once that's undermined, um, the the parliament can't uh, can't get anyone to obey its its orders, right? And so the rest of the story is is the important part, right? Is that parliament kills the king and then parliament is immediately overthrown by the army, which is a bunch of religious fanatics. And, and then you have um, 10 years of rule of dictatorship 
And Hume says, look, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it would be much better to have a republic with a rule of law rather than to have a dictator. But under the circumstances in which you've undermined any sense of common belonging, right, dictatorship may have been the only regime that was possible in England in 1650. That doesn't mean that we like it, but it's it's that's just kind of the way that it is. So um, I think that Hume sa- thinks, you know, it's better to have a regime where parliament is the main thing, and you've got a king that somehow represents the, the nation as a whole. But once you've done away with the king, you have this long period between 1650 and really 1688. That's one long, it's sort of the civil war as a cold war, right, with some hot moments. Um, but it takes a long time to build up that sense of trust that you really mm-hmm. need in order to have a regime that, that can rule by rule of law. Yeah. How well – so Hume has obviously in philosophy has had an enormous influence. Yeah. But in political science, I mean one of the uh, risks of being super empirical in your work is that as we learn more over time, your conclusions can look wrong because it turns out we have better data. So how well has his – as Hume as the political scientist held up over the years? Um, well, as Hume as the political scientist? Well, um, I would say pretty well. I mean I would say um, I would say maybe the most important point is that Hume doesn't say my empirical results are the only thing or the most important thing, right? The most important thing is a certain kind of skeptical empirical spirit attitude towards politics like the stance. And so even if the particular results are wrong, that you're still exemplifying a certain kind of stance. Okay? So that part I think is still is still strong. Um, but you know, look, I mean, it was he so wrong that um, regimes that are devoted to allowing individuals to lead their lives the way that they see fit are, you know, uh, better on the whole than other kinds of regimes. That doesn't seem wrong. Is is he wrong that we need to have separation of powers and a certain kind of competition between um, different branches of government in order to keep any one government, any one part from becoming tyrannical. That doesn't seem wrong. Uh, is he wrong that um, in order to have these kinds of regimes, you need to have a kind of middle class that that is dependent on – it can't be that the government just gives everyone stuff, right, because sooner or later the government's going to run out of places to get the stuff, that you need to have a vibrant economy. That doesn't seem to be wrong either, right? So. Um, those would I think are the most important sort of empirical conversations, right, or conclusions that he would he would draw. So, yeah, that's what I would say. So let me ask about this. Is maybe jumping backwards in the order of how we ought to have been discussing things. But okay. for for listeners who are you know, new to Hume or haven't read him, the one line that basi- that lots of people know from Hume yes. is this. Reason is the slave of the passions. Yes. Line. What does that mean? So, um, the classical model was uh, so if you read Plato's Republic, right? There, in inside the soul, there are three parts, right? And there, on the bottom is desire, like you want all this stuff, you know, sex and money and all that kind of stuff. In the middle is spiritedness, the part that gets make you get angry and you want to stand up and fight with people. And then on the top should be reason, right? And reason as calculative reason, but also reason as somehow comprehending the whole of the universe. Um, that seems, uh, you know, whether that's accurate. I mean, there's clearly something to that. We all sort of recognize those, those three parts, but um, that's a very hierarchical picture of what the self is. Um, Hume's view is much more the Machiavellian view that passion is the core of what human beings are. That the core of what human beings are is this sort of infinite desire for more and more stuff, and that, and that way he is like Hobbes, um, and that reason is, uh, in many cases, is an instrument of those passions rather than the thing that is somehow dominating or ruling the passions. That it's not a separate faculty in the way that Plato seems to say, and. Um, I mean I think that he thinks it's an empirical – that's an empirical question. He's also – he has a different conception of reason than I think than Plato does. I mean he think, he's thinking of something like calculative reason or Cartesian reason uh, in which you're just sort of saying you know, what are the pros and cons or what are the benefits and the, the, the vices of this course of action. So um, 
and lots of people, especially Kantians, find that to be a, a really disturbing thing to say that somehow we're just these animals that don't really have – because I think Kantians want to say there's this part of us that's pure reason that can somehow stand above our passionate selves and put it all in order. Um, and that, that's – I don't have any great answer to that question. But I would say that Hume – Hume also has this sense that there is a sense of reason itself as a passion, that there is this part of us that wants to know the truth about things. And so that – when he says that in the Treatise of Human Nature, he says at the end of book two and then several chapters later, he's got a chapter on the love of truth um, as sort of like the culminating passion of the entire discussion. And so he seems to think that there's some part of the human being that wants to know what the actual truth is. And no matter how ugly or disturbing that might be and that from a certain point of view, in Hume's accounts of himself, that looks like that's the ruling passion, right? That's the, the passion that, that dominates his own understanding of who he is. So in that way, that's not so far from the platonic notion that we're not – I mean passion does – isn't simply the same thing as I want a lot of stuff and I want you know, more food and I want more sex or whatever. Um, that their philosophy itself for Hume is a passion and that's that's an important fact. There's another dimension to that question that if you want me to talk sure. about. Yeah. Um, which is that uh, I mean the passions also learn for Hume. The passions get smarter and they get smarter and more efficient about um, fulfilling themselves and that his political science is in a way an attempt to educate the passions to um, being more sensible about you know what does it mean to try to, to seek satisfaction, right? And so Hume's political science is an attempt to bring reason to bear on passion. So that also has to be part of that conversation. I think that's one of the things – I mean there's a real sense in reading Hume um, that you get less of in say Kant or many other philosophers of like a humanity that I think is a big part of – his appeal that that even even if you're disagreeing with what he says, there's a sense of like a that that passion for basically everything is there throughout it. Um, in fact, I mean, I was trying to think of this like: is there anyone, any major figure in the Western canon outside of maybe Socrates that it would be more fun to go to a pub with than? David Hume? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I don't know, Boccaccio maybe or somebody like that. Um, no, I think that's right. And I think that that's, that's part of the attraction of Hume is that when he I – mean, he understands himself as a philosopher that in order to understand all these highfalutin philosophy things, you have to start by understanding human beings. And that means that you have to understand them sort of as they understand themselves. And um, – you know, there's this great line from a Roman playwright, um, nothing human is alien to me, that I think really get, captures something of the spirit of Hume's political science, that it's not we're going to so solve all these problems or create a rational order in human beings, but that um, somehow that's part of the, you know, the joy of the thing is to somehow see human beings in all of their greatness and all of their ugliness, right, that Hume has a, a vivid sense of – just what crazy, weird, wonderful, or awful maybe uh, things that human beings are. So I think that does go very much to, the, to, to your question about humanity. Yeah. Well, when I was first introduced or first read uh, Hume in undergrad, I mean something that really comes out um, is that he, he is a joy to read, uh, which you can't say for, of all philosophers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, yeah. He clearly – uh, has a style that is still uh, that still resonates today, that is still engaging and interesting, and I think uh, some of uh, our listeners who are perhaps not familiar with you might want to know where to start. Uh, if someone um, has listened to this and is convinced that he, uh, he's worth reading, uh, where would you uh, recommend that people new to Hume uh, dig their feet in first? Yeah, so I think the, the the core of the political teaching, if you want to understand classical liberalism, uh, for me are really the essays. Right, and um, both so there are political essays at the beginning when he lays out his political science. That's the stuff that leads into Madison. Um, there's also um, a really brilliant series of essays on philosophers that I think um, is also political in, in a strange kind of way. Um, and then in the second part of the essays, there's all these essays about commerce, and there's essays about how to think about politics. Um, think about political controversies. Um, so I think, I mean, he, and he means those essays to be accessible to 
um, the middling rank of men, right, to normal human beings, not to philosophers sitting in their offices somewhere, not definitely not to professional philosophers, but to human beings who are just trying to figure out what's this messy world. So that's one place that I would start. Um, I would also I – mean, the text that's closest to my heart is the um, – is uh, the text at the end of book one of the Treatise of Human Nature in which he describes his – what you might call his existential crisis about philosophy and his turn to moral and political things. And to me, that's, that's a very short text. Um, it's harrowing, right? I mean he, he goes off the rails and he, it seems like he's going to commit suicide or something. Um, but that's a text you – know, when I, you know, I teach a lot of undergraduates and I think that, that you know, they often – sort of when they really start thinking about the world, they also have that kind of skeptical crisis mm -hmm. and that there's something that's very vivid and very honest about that. that um, but in some ways, all of Hume is contained within that one, you know, it's like a 10-page chapter. So I would say those two things are the things that I would, I would start with. So for those of us today listening to this, I mean, obviously, Hume is of terrific historical interest. He's of just plain literary interest. Um, but what is his – does he have – his thought have significance for where we find ourselves and the issues we face today? Right. So I would say um, – I mean I think classical liberalism is still you know, it's not a force to be reckoned with and a, and a serious contender in the, in the um, marketplace of ideas. Um, but I would say – I mean from Hume's point of view, we human beings are always falling into ideological – like we want to have answers to the, to the world. That are going to put everything to a box and then just solve it. And he would say part of the danger of democratic politics is that we're working out our own psychodramas on the – we want to solve the problem of the world and so we look for some savior who's going to come along. And Hume is just very skeptical that there is any such person who's going to save us from ourselves. Um, but there's a passage that I think um, – it's not so much the, the specific conclusions that I think are important for us today as a certain kind of ethos or a certain kind of stance towards politics. And so if it's OK with you, I'd like to just read this. This is from Hume's essays, the very end of the book. Um, and he's been discussing political controversies in English history and basically saying there's something to be said on both sides of the question. So um, – uh, this is from the essay of the Protestant secession. He says, it appears to me that these advantages and disadvantages uh, in the positions he's just been talking about are allowed on both sides, at least by everyone who is at all susceptible of argument or reasoning. Um, and so this is a controversy we just have to work through. Um, and then he goes on. It belongs therefore to a philosopher alone who is of neither party to put all the circumstances in the scale and assign to each of them its proper poise and influence. Such a one will readily at first acknowledge that all political questions are infinitely complicated and that there scarcely ever occurs in any deliberation a choice which is either purely good or purely ill. Consequences mixed and varied may be, seen to f may be foreseen to flow from every measure and many consequences unforeseen do always in fact result from every one. Hesitation and reserve and suspense are therefore the only sentiments that he brings to this essay or trial. Or if he indulges any passion, it is that of derision against the ignorant multitude who are always clamorous and dogmatical, even in the nicest questions, of which from want of temper, perhaps still more than of understanding, they're altogether unfit judges. Um, I think it's that temperament, that kind of ethos that is Hume is trying to um, give us an education in. And one thing that's really striking, right? So uh, obviously there's nothing that's purely good or purely bad. And so you sort of have to work through what are the pros and cons, even of a commercial republicanism, right? There's some things that are good and some things that are bad. Um, and there are going to be unforeseen consequences that are going to mess all of your expectations up. You just need to be ready for that. But I think the thing that's really interesting is he says um, hesitation uh, and reserve are the only sentiments he brings to this essay or trial that the attitude of the philosopher from his point of view and, and what a skeptical philosopher in politics will see himself as doing is doing essays, right? The original meaning of essays is that you try something out. Well, if you put this together with the fact that the title of the book is Essays, right? Moral, political and literary. Um, I think he's kind of cluing you into what the, what the meaning of the book as a whole is, that if you translate it, what the um, – a book of essays is practice in being a philosopher, right? It's not giving you the answer. It's more like taking you to the gym and saying, well, I need to work out. I need to exercise every day for you know, three months before I run a marathon or something. Um, 
and that that's what all you sort of have to take all these things in the right spirit that you're sort of being forced to habituate yourself to trying things out to seeing what the pros and cons are. I think that's really the spirit that, I mean, not to make any contemporary <laughs> political statements, but that we need in American politics more than anything else. It's so easy to become ideological. Um, and to me, that's, you know, that's the spirit of classical liberalism at its heart. That's the thing that, that's really still living about it. Thank you for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.